like I use a five zone system. I use it as a starting point. We have zone one is active recovery, which we use 56% of VO2 max or less. Uh, I'll, I'll keep that out of it just for now. That's like very rarely would I give someone zone one. It's basically a walk. It's a very, very okay. light, light spin, 10, 15 minutes and we're done. I, I very rarely sort of actually prescribe it. It's kind of something that just happens. Zone two is our uh, really everything active recovery up to our VT1 that we talked about before. Zone three is VT1 to VT2. So yep. simple, it blocks all of our threshold tempo, all of that race specific gray zone type stuff. It's really, really good for event specificity, but not great for aerobic captation. Bundles it all into one. VT2 up to VO2 max is what we call zone four. So that's our predominantly our long interval type range, three minute, four minute, 95% of VO2 max type stuff we said. And then anything above 100% of VO2 max, we just term it as zone five because and it's an open-ended zone because it just depends on what, what is our goal of that session. Is our goal to be better at, um, uh, have a better VO2 max? We're doing 30 on 30 offs. That's well above VO2 max, we're not 120%. Or is our goal to do maximal sprinting type stuff? All of that is things like heart rate. That so Nick, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, for the listener, we've just been rehearsing Nick's surname. So I get it correct. And uh, it's Nick Jankowskis. How was that? Spot on. First okay. go. Got it. <laughs> Could you tell uh, our listeners just a little bit about yourself and your professional work? Yeah. So yeah, thanks. For, thanks for having me on the on the podcast. And um, I'm a I'm a sports scientist uh, from Melbourne, Australia. So specialising in the the endurance space is is primarily what I've done the last sort of well, five five years now. So primarily working with um, runners, triathletes cyclists, a uh, handful of rowers, kayakers, or anyone that really fits that bill of endurance-related uh, athlete, and particularly the individual type sports as well, um, predominantly as well in the in the lab testing space. So um, I know that's where we're going to talk in a moment in terms of identifying training zones, understanding things like VO2 max and, and threshold and alike, and, and using some of that data to then implement into, into effective training programs. So we're very much centered in, in understanding what an athlete can do, um, being able to use that create create a, an intervention for them or program for them and then monitor that progress over time. So um, that's primarily where I've spent my professional career. And then as as most of us in the sort of industry do, we dabble in our own performance where we can. Um, so I've raced a bit in terms of triathlon, not not super, super competitively, um, but when I can. And then uh, then I umpire Australian rules football is my, my main sport. So um, people might uh, not fully understand that, but it involves about 14 to 16 Ks of, of running a game and about two and a half to three Ks of high intensity running. So it's pretty, uh, oh, right. from an endurance athlete perspective, it, yeah. it, uh, it ticks a lot of boxes, but it's very different to the, the typical marathon runner or triathlete that I see. So good little change up from that. Yeah, that's an interesting, I suppose, it reminds, I used to play soccer a lot when I was younger. It sounds very, I was midfielder. So it was a lot of that kind very of jog, similar. slightly higher intensity yeah. jog, slightly higher intensity, that kind of thing. Yeah, very similar. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you anything about Aussie rules now. When I was there, I used to watch it on TV on my own, and I, I could not understand what was going on. <laughs> like I, I tried really hard. But... <laughs> yeah, it's it's a pretty chaotic, uh, chaotic sort of game. And uh, there's one great YouTube video. I think they they did it for the US market explaining what Australian rules is. Uh, oh, okay. that's, that's not bad. I think it summarizes in about two minutes. Um, so if you can find that one. Uh, I'll put that in the description, one, yeah, it's, definitely. It's a little off yeah. topic, but uh, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand, like, looking from the outside in, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's not the, the easiest sport to understand, but it's definitely entertaining and super exciting. So, yeah, yeah, a uh, bit of fun. Well, I used to see a lot of injured Aussie rules athletes when I was there. Um, yeah. And, it, yeah, it's, it's intense. Um, it's, yeah. it's that sort of mix between very explosive, high-intensity stuff and then a lot of low intensity sort of endurancey stuff, I think it makes for quite the conditioning challenge. Yeah, really, really sort of bizarre mix of mix of things. That's what I said in terms of like, I mean, we're sort of very similar profile from a from an officiating standpoint. We we have similar running profiles to what the midfielders do. Um and in terms of the the distance covered, yeah, you're looking at 14, 16 kilometers a game and lots of high intensity in there, lots of maximal sprinting or a change of direction. We're fortunate enough that we don't get tackled and hit, which is <laughs> nice. But, but the players, obviously, it, it's a full contact sport. Um, 
And for for the, like, I always sort of joke about with any of my American friends that it's it's much more brutal than the US sports. We don't have padding or anything like that. So mm. it, yeah, for, from a from an injury perspective, it's it's super chaotic. But um, yeah, from a from a spectacle and watching it, uh, it's it's probably one of the better sports going mm. around. I would have thought. It's like I'm that, a uh, Australian. <laughs> Putting, putting. What, what do we need putting for? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that sort yeah. of Australian rough attitude. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll be right. We'll just run full pace at each other and we'll be okay. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you a little bit about training zones, as you know. So, yeah. um, you know, training zones. You you would think it's a quite straightforward topic, but there's there's lots of different spins on it and different um, thresholds and markers and ways to determine it and and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And I find, you know, from uh, originally quite a simple starting point of different intensity of training distribution, you can end up with, you know, personally, I get quite confused about it. You know, when when different yeah. people are talking about different jo- zones, I'm different, reading material by different authors and trying to work out you know, when he says zone four, what does he mean? Is he talking about the same thing as someone else? And how do they differ? And how do they determine where is what? So what I was hoping to do was sort of start at the basics of what what the zones are trying to achieve. And then maybe a couple of sort of physiological markers or how you would determine someone's zones to hopefully help people and myself understand how to interpret different systems if we know the sort of basics. So if we just start with a basic question of what are training zones, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of how confusing it can be. And, and even at times I look at different papers or different pieces of work and I'm, I'm confused at what they were trying to trying to get at sometimes as well. But I think the, the whole premise of training zones is just dividing up. It, it's dividing up your physiology to then be really targeted in what you're trying to do with your training. That's probably the best way I can describe it overall. So if you're looking at, if, if I think of a, a common endurance athlete, well, a big part of your, your programming, if you're a marathon runner or a triathlete, it is going to be building up those longer, slower kilometers, if you want to call it that. So the point of training zones for that purpose is, all right, let's establish a zone that really, I guess, makes us a bit more disciplined in what we're doing. So we're not going to go out and just, run as hard and as fast as we can all the time or ride as hard and as fast as we can all the time. It's it's just giving that clear clear guide and clear um, distinction of, well, what am I trying to get out of this, this session? So for the long, slow stuff, it's all right. I might be limiting my heart rate, for example, below, pick a number, 160 beats per minute. That, that might be my appropriate zone that's going to give me maximal adaptation. So I know when I'm out there middle of a session or back end of a session, I'm starting to get a bit fatigued. I've got that little trigger in my mind. That's that's how I really present it to a lot of athletes and, and a lot of coaches as well is really training zones are there just as an assisting guide. Mm-hmm. Um, the really important part with them is understanding them. But uh, mm-hmm. like, like you said before, you've you got to know what they actually mean. Uh, otherwise, you, you kind of have a, a handful of numbers, whether it is heart rate based, whether it's power based, whether it's pace based. You have a bunch of numbers that, that you kind of have a, a bit of an idea of, all right, well, Low, lower heart rate should generally mean lower intensity. It's sort of a bit intuitive like that, but what am I actually achieving out of doing a session within a zone two, for example, or what does a zone two, what does a zone four give me differently and comparatively differently? I know it's going to be harder, but what is the actual outcome of that session? I think that background is, is really important to understand. Um, but, and that sort of then comes into, well, which zone system do you want to choose? I mean, mm-hmm. I've probably, I've seen everything from, <clears throat> from three zone systems to 11 zone systems and variations in between. Like well, I personally use a, a five zone most of the time um, for, for a lot of athletes I work with, particularly once we've done some lab testing on them. And I'll get into a few reasons why probably in a bit later, but um, I've seen variations of a five zone system as well. So it's that, that means slightly different things or slightly different terms. It can be a bit tricky, but you, you just sort of got to navigate what are the commonalities between all of these things and that, like, what are the common markers that we're looking for? And I know I mentioned we'll, we'll sort of touch on like the, the key parts of physiology, but I think that's the, the best basis of understanding any zone system is, well, what are the key things in our physiology that are going to be common regardless of what you choose mm-hmm. and what you, what you want to use? And what would they be? Do you have, 
you know, when you're working with an athlete, do you have a starting point? So say you've got a sort of blank canvas. I come to see you. I have no concept of training zones or anything, and you're going to try and help me develop one uh, that's personalized to me. Where do you start? Place I start is in in my work is VO2 max, given that I've got access to lab testing and um, that that's basically what I what I do. Um, mm. If you didn't have access to that, um, there, there's there's obviously field testing alternatives like time trials and and, and things like that you, you can do as well that are the comparative. But even something as simple as literally just going, if you're a runner, go and warm yourself up and then run as hard and as fast as you possibly can for sort of four minutes. Mm. Take your maximum heart rate at the end of that. That that already compared to a lot of training zones that work off the, the classic 220 minus your age for what your maximum heart rate theoretically is and then take percentages of that. If you go out and do a four-minute maximal effort as hard and as fast as you can, you're going to get a more accurate representation of what that maximum heart rate is. Then use those formulas if you wanted to. I mean, that's even a really, really simple way of starting. Okay. Because um, some of those percentages of heart rate are, are pretty good. I mean, some, some of the, when I say more generic ways of zones, if you look up a, a calculator for for training zones based on heart rate they're pretty good the, the thing that skews it is well the maximum heart rate estimate was wrong to begin with mm, okay um so if you're then trying to take like if you do 220 miles your age I, I know for me it's gonna it's gonna be uh what 195 but i know from a running perspective i can get on the treaty and and go up to max and I've, i'll see something like 197 199 occasionally but on the bike i'll struggle to get past 192 Mm-hmm. So, so that's where just having that little bit of added accuracy by doing a very, very simple test, four minute maximal effort, already just makes some of those zones a hell of a lot more accurate. But for, from a from a lab testing perspective, I always like to start with VO2 max because that's our kind of marker for everything. It's what is your maximum aerobic ability fundamentally? What is the maximum amount of oxygen you can take in transport, utilize in one minute? That being your VO2 max you can work out everything works off a percentage of that because ultimately mm-hmm. that's the dictator of the size of your engine. So mm-hmm. I always like to use that as a starting point uh, of identifying all my zones or using a percentage of, of zones, um, uh, like a percentage of VO to max for my zones, given that I can't have a, for example, I can't have an FTP of 300 if my VO to max is only at 270 watts. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't work. Your, your VO to max has to be that upper marker for all those submaximal intensities, which endurance athletes are predominantly working in submaximal. Yes, we are working hard, but we're not working right at that upper limit um, for long periods of time. You just can't sustain it. Um, so, so I like to use that as a as a real starting point, and then a couple of different couple of different thresholds depending on um, depending on what access to data I have. Um, if I've only got VO two max, or, or if I've only got an equivalent of VO two max or a time trial or another test maybe an MAP test on a trainer, then I'll use percentages. But if I've got my full set of lab data, or I've got blood lactate, I've got ventilation data and the like, then I'll start to get a little bit more detailed in in terms of, I don't want to get too complex here, but ventilatory thresholds and lactate thresholds. And, and that can really then start to refine out the rest of the information a little bit more specific than just using a, a calculation. But I think if, if you're starting out using zones, I mean, the absolute minimum I would go to is, yeah, get, get a pretty well-respected, calculator of say heart rate um, heart rate zones in terms of percentages but go and do that maximum test field test first that that's that's automatically going to increase the likelihood that those zones are going to be accurate um, compared to if you just punch in your age and hope for this yeah Yeah, so i thought maybe if we come back to the heart rate um Mm -hmm. and the practical field test in a sec but so you you go with your vo2 max right and you you read someone's vo2 max what are you looking at that there, you know, so you're saying the maximum amount of oxygen that they can take in and use within one minute. And is that the the speed that they're running at that uh, effort? Is it the speed that they're biking? Is it their heart rate at that effort? Is it their power if they're on a bike? Like, what, are you, or is it all of them? You know, what what is that um, number? Yeah, so so in terms of what I'm, what I'm looking at from that perspective, it really is a combination of kind of all of those factors. So if we, if we start with a, Start with a cyclist because I think that's probably the, the more simplified version given that cycling, once you're locked into your position, so you exclude bike fit and all of that, you, you're kind of stuck on the bike, you, your mm. pedals are clipped in. We, we can't change any of the, I guess, 
Like it's not like running where I can cue you to change your technique and that's going to influence your running economy in terms of how much oxygen you use to, to create that output. So from a cycling perspective, we're looking at power because that's the physiological output. Um, speed is heavily determined by what resistances do you have, which way the wind's blowing, what skin suit are you wearing, what helmet mm-hmm. have you got, what's your bike fit, what bike you want. That, that's all That's all sort of external. So that's kind of a, a product of that. So that's where we look at we look at what is your power at VO2 max. It's probably more critical to me than the actual oxygen consumption number, given that, I mean, someone who's really effective at using oxygen may not necessarily, and this is more pronounced in runners, and I'll get to that in a sec, but someone who has a VO2 max of, say, 60 mils per kilo per minute as a relative, pretty good VO2 max for, say, an amateur. Like, that'd be pretty, I, I sort of use that as, as a bit of a, tick the box when I've got someone coming in for the first time going, all right, amateur, amateur athlete, if you can get 60, like, yeah, you're doing pretty well. Um, like it, they could have a VO max of 60 versus someone who could have a VO max of 70. And they might be very similarly, similarly trained, for example, I'm more likely to take the person who's got a VO max of 60, but can produce 30 or 40 Watts more for that oxygen consumption than someone who can use a lot of oxygen, but it's not really giving them an output. Mm, okay. Does that sort of make sense? So, yeah. because from a performance perspective, it's well, if I if, if everything was equal in terms of all those aerodynamics we talked about, if I put those two athletes on the road and I get them to ride at their VO two max power, they're probably going to last somewhere between five to seven minutes, absolute max effort, and they're probably going to burn out after that. If everything else was equal, the person who's producing thirty watts more is going to go faster. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so that that's where oxygen consumption alone, so the actual VO2 max number, yes, it's useful, but it can be sometimes a bit misleading because you could have, I mean, takes uh, some of our, some of our, particularly our female elite athletes that we come and see in the lab might just be really, really light. So their, their actual absolute oxygen consumption isn't very high, but they're super light. So they might have a VO2 of 65 or 70. Mm-hmm. They might only produce 200. And 10 240 watts which isn't super high oh uh, okay um, I see. so so that's where it's really a combination of some of these variables and then i mean we you could go even more detailed i look at other components to that like what was ventilation doing as a result so how much how much air are we getting in per minute just air total coming into lungs at our maximal level how does that interact with we use what we call fraction of expired oxygen so feo2 which is just a measure of the percentage of oxygen you're breathing back out so you're expiring. Yeah. What that then tells me is that, well, if I'm at pretty much sea level conditions in our lab, 21% of the air roughly is oxygen that we're breathing in. If I'm breathing back out 19% of that, <laughs> I'm not using as much as someone who might be breathing out 15%. Huh. It's really simply, it's a marker of how much oxygen are we actually using at the working muscle? So I might be able to have someone who breathes in a hell of a lot of air, but they're, they're just wasting all of that oxygen. So now I know apart from just what their total VO2 was, what power they could produce, I now know where within that chain is a bit broken and where can we, where can we implement some strategies to fix it? Oh, um, so, so all of, all of that, I know that's sort of going a little bit, sort of going a bit more advanced. That, that's all sort of what I'm looking at from a VO2 perspective. It's, it's all of these factors interacting together, but primarily it's, well, what is our output at VO2 max? Running doesn't necessarily differ too much. You just have to then factor in what is someone's running economy, which probably mm-hmm. even highlights further that difference in well, the actual oxygen consumption number may not be the best. I mean, classic yep. case is like if you look at the the initial trials into things like the vapor flies and that with with Nike, like Kipchoge doesn't have necessarily the highest oxygen consumption comparative to a lot of these other world class runners but he is the fastest runner. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. kind of like, like, who are we going to put, who are we going to put in the shoe to try and do a, a sub two? Well, why not pick the fastest runner mm-hmm. rather than just the person who's got the best physiology? It's like they, they output the same speed, but Kipchoge's able to do it for longer. Hence why he wins because he's got so, better economy. So that's where that comes into it a bit. So again, I'm looking more at speed and pace at VO2 max there rather than power on a run. Yeah, I think I understand. So you you, you want to know, when they hit their VO2 max, how fast are they running? Or yep. if they're on the bike, how much power are they putting out? Correct. Because that tells you your starting point for determining their training zones and and, and gives you a sort of um, an anchor point from which to do your other analyses. That's like, okay, that's their VO2 yep. max power or that's their VO2 max pace. And I can work from there. Now, 
I think we might put things like running economy and bike fit and just it makes to one it way side. More complicated. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Put it to a side if we're talking just purely training sense, because it, it does complicate things quite a bit. Yeah. And then we're just looking at um in terms of training, we're trying to design intensity. Do you know what I mean? So now we've got yeah. our VO2 max uh, power or pace, and uh, depending on if we're running or biking. And then where do you go from there? Like what's next on your list of to do things to look at? Yeah. So the 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 major thing that is next from my perspective is uh what we call your ventilatory threshold one or your your lactate threshold one very fancy term for saying what is the upper limit of my long slow continuous training so if i'm going to go out and do a long slow run what is the highest intensity that i can go at before it becomes basically a tempo and we're not really getting those really good aerobic effects it's starting to change the session a bit so Mm -hmm. for a lot of people this is going to be if you use a five zone system, we're talking like a zone two. If you use seven zone systems, it might be similar, but it's really, that's my next point that I look at. Most athletes' minds will jump to lactate threshold or, or functional threshold. That this what, sort of why, do you, why are you more interested in that one? And Largely, actually, could you just explain just yeah. briefly the difference between LT1 and LT2? And LT2, yeah. yeah so, and then why are you more interested in LT1? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of the difference between the two, Commonly from a blood lactate perspective, if I'm measuring blood lactate in the lab, LT1 is going to be really, we identified as the first real increase in blood lactate from our resting state. So most people well-rested will come in. They're about one to two millimoles of blood lactate at rest. And they'll probably maintain that for a couple of intensities throughout a test at their long slow. So if you think about, um, Think about going out and going at a very, very easy conversational type intensity where you could easily, you're not having broken sentences while you run or something. That's where you're probably going to be at one, maybe two millimoles of blood lactate largely. It's very easy to accommodate. Um, it's very comfortable and intensity. You can feel like you do it all day. That first little increase happens around about two and a half, sometimes three. Now, we don't just rely purely on blood lactate. We look at a change in ventilation as well. And these match up perfectly because blood lactate at the end of the, or blood lactate is an indicator for lactic acid <laughs> to, to sort of flow chart this for you. We look at blood lactate because it's easy to measure. It's really, it's the bigger part of lactic acid. So we can get a handheld unit. We can take a little finger prick sample and we can measure it. That tells us a bit of information in regards to, well, how much of the acidic part of lactic acid. So the hydronine part, which is the actual fatiguing part that is the burning sensation you feel in, in the legs when it starts to get hard. So it gives an index as an indicator of that. But what we know is when we increase the acidity in the body, the body's initial response to that is to balance it out by getting oxygen in. So there's going to be an uptick in ventilation as a response. Okay. So that's why so, your breathing just starts to increase a little bit. So you're running correct. along, ambling really slowly, or let's say yep. a very comfortable pace for you. And your lactate in your blood is you know, one or two millimoles and you don't feel anything, so nothing changes. And then you increase your pace just a little bit, the blood lactate rises just a smidge and your body senses that and thinks, well, I've got to get more oxygen in. I forget why you said, but it thinks that, and that's why your respiratory rate goes up just a little tiny bit. Yeah, spot on. So really what, it'll be very stable. We're not talking at this point at this LT1 or this, we call it VT1 as well from a ventilation side of things. At this point, we're not talking, it's overwhelming. So the body's able to manage this. It's mm-hmm. just a little uptick in um, blood lactate, which is coming from body just going, I need a little bit more anaerobic energy, still a very, very tiny amount, but I need a little bit more just to help me out just because of that little increase in intensity. And most people will kind of know this as I'm having a really easy conversation while I run and now I'm struggling to start to get some words out. Okay. Like it's it's a little bit broken sentence. It's not complete. I just feel like I can't talk, but it's I'm, I'm noticing I'm having to pause between words to take my breath. That's kind of the tipping point from a practical sense. And is that um, so why it, you can still sustain oh, it? No, no, go. Yep. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask. Is that why? So LT one lactate is it threshold one? It it is or sometimes termed as lactate oh. threshold lactate threshold one. It gets a bit confusing because, I mean, there's a bunch of different terms for our okay. second point that we'll get to. Right, okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I commonly refer more to as VT1, which is ventilatory threshold, because it's I'm probably more looking at that ventilation 
response but, to the lactate increase. Right. But yeah, so physiologically, they are the same in the way that we just yeah. described. The lactate sort of drives the increase in respiration. So that's why your ventilatory threshold has been reached. But the lactate has also reached a certain level. That's why that lactate threshold, so LT1 and VT1, they're the same. So yep. now we know where VO2 max is. We know where LT1 and L, LT1 slash VT1 are VT1. on our yep. little spectrum of intensity. All right, where are we going next? What do you what do you want to know next? Well, then really, the, when I say the last point that I look at is, well, what is our, most people will call it lactate threshold. But Actually, it has a million before names. we go there, Nick, I want to yeah. just make sure I make this point. So... What you're looking at at L, you want the intensity at which LT1 slash VT1 occurs. Mm -hmm. You want to know what their power is at that yep. pace, at that yep. intensity, or their running pace. Is that right? Yeah. So at, at that L, LT1 VT1, I want to know what what their pace and power is, but probably even more so, I want to know what their heart rate's doing there. Ah, okay. The reason for that is because. When, when I said before with VO2 max at the top end, I want to know power and pace because likely in sessions that are going to be in and around that VO2 max area, so from what we know with that, it's, it's your high-intensity interval training, your really hard, short, sharp stuff. We don't have time to see heart rate get up to where it needs to. So in a 90-second interval, it's very rare for someone to go from 100 beats per minute or 130 beats per minute after their warm-up to 190 in 90 mm. seconds it's just not going to happen mm -hmm. so i need a really clear idea of well what what intensity am i holding so i know i'm not going too hard or not going hard enough either mm -hmm. way i need to make sure i'm bang on in those types of efforts so pace and power makes sense for shorter stuff when we talk about the bottom end i'm probably then more interested in heart rate because yes there's going to be a lag in the initial period but a lag of heart rate of say 45 seconds to 60 seconds to get from pretty much resting up to that long, slow, continuous strain that we're looking for, 45 to 60 seconds out of a two-hour run is not going to make a world of difference. Mm -hmm. And I'm more, I'm more interested in that physiological investment of what is the body having to undergo to produce this output? Because it gives me a clear insight into, all right, if I jump into that session and my heart rate comes up pretty progressively and I'm running it, let's say the top end of that, that, that VT1 happens at, 160 beats a minute, make it nice and simple. If I'm if I'm cruising along at 155, so just sub that, that'd be probably ideal for most runs. If I'm ticking along and I know, all right, well, when I did my testing, that 160 beats a minute was at five minute K pace, but I'm running along today and I'm feeling really good, like I'm well rested, well hydrated, good nutrition. I'm running 155 and I'm running at 445 pace. Hmm. All right, things things are progressing really really well. Like clearly in the in the time I've been training, I'm getting some clear improvement. That's what we want to see. On the flip side, if I'm feeling pretty average and fatigued and I jump into that run at 155, I'm getting the same physiological investment as my good day. But what I might be seeing instead is my pace might be 515 pace. Mm -hmm. I'm just feeling really sluggish. My body's working just as hard. And that's kind of the, the key distinction there is I'm still going to get a very similar stimulus whether I run faster or slower based on if I'm, if I'm at the same heart rate, mm -hmm. the body's working internally just the same. Mm -hmm. And all it knows in that session is, well, I just need to keep putting one foot in front of the other. That's kind of right. the purpose of those sessions is build yeah. a bit of muscular endurance and build that, just put the, the cardiovascular system primarily under enough enough stress to get the adaptation. So that's all we're really looking at. The, the output of that, as we said before, is then going to get into the complexities of well, what was my running technique like and my economy and all of that. that. That all leaving aside, if we're looking purely physiological stimulus from a session down there, I'm mainly looking at heart rate. Because yep. it's going to tell me a lot as the session progresses. Things like as heart rate drift starts to kick in, um, does heart rate stay the same and pace stays the same? Does pace start to drop but heart rate stays the same? All of these things I can now analyze and get a really good insight in terms of the, what's happening in the session. Um, so that that's where I then sort of distinguish what metric I use. All of these still match up, of course. And I'm still mm -hmm. looking at pace in the bottom end or power, but it's heart rate that's my primary go-to. Okay. So all across the board, I'm looking at, yeah, heart rate and what the out external output is as well. So internal and external variables there. Um, but low end, more so heart rate dominant, upper end, more so power dominant. And that's where probably the, the next point in terms of that commonly known functional threshold, anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold, from a lab testing perspective, now we're talking about LT2 or VT2. 
that's where you can then alternate either because they kind of fall in between. Just okay. depends on the type of session you're going for. Okay. So before we move to that, actually, just mm -hmm. to try and um, make this in a practice, I, I don't know if you know if you've tested yourself recently. Do you know what your LT1 heart rate is roughly for you? Yeah. So the last, well, the last time I did a lab test would have been a little while ago. Um, <laughs> just, just for an example for the list, it doesn't have to be exact. Yeah. So my, well, for like to, to go, to go sort of down there, my VO2 max heart rate from a running perspective is probably at about 196, 197 at the moment. I would okay. put it on based on a couple of sessions I've done recently. I would probably say that I usually carry a reasonably high heart rate given the nature of the stuff I do is more high intensity, less long, slow running. So okay. I probably would be sitting about 170 to 175 would be the absolute upper limit for me. For really slow. For, for my, VT, my VT1 would oh, probably okay. sit around that 170 to 175. I'm quite high. Like yeah. I said, that's largely a byproduct of, I don't really like my longest, when I say my longest run usually in a 12 month period, like continuous run, it's probably only like 50 or 60 minutes. So I, see. I, I do it just a lot of, but there's the nature of, the sport I do in terms of it's very stop start. Yeah. Um, I just see so all your zones are kind of squashed up at the at yeah. the upper end. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, so very, um, very quickly I go from feeling pretty <laughs> comfortable to not having a great time to oh I'm pretty comfortable again because I'm used to doing the really hard stuff. But yeah. now I need a break. So I've almost joked that most of the time if I go back and race something like triathlon, I'd probably be. I, well, I did it in a seventy point three. I just run aid stations. Yeah. Run for 2K like reasonably quick. hard, walk through the gate <laughs> station, <laughs> grab some nutrition, chill out for a minute or two, and then go again. And I end up coming out probably a better time than what I would do long slow because I just don't <laughs> want to keep the heart rate up there for too long. Okay, so now video. we know pace, power, and heart rate at VO2 max and at LT1, which is yep. also known as VT1, we've now learned. And then, okay, so what's up next? What are we looking at? What are you so looking really for the, next? The, yeah, so the last point is, uh, as I alluded to before, is that whatever you want to call it, anaerobic threshold, functional threshold, lactate inflection point, lactate threshold, they're, they're all kind of meaning the same thing. This this point here is that that theoretical 45 minutes to an hour intensity. So when people think of threshold, they think of time trialing for 60 minutes, basically. Mm -hmm. What is the what is the highest sustainable output you can you can hold for 45 to 60 minutes? That's what we're looking at here. Um, what that matches up with is our lactate threshold two or our ventilatory threshold too. So this is just the second change. So for most people from a blood lactate perspective, it's around, I mean, the old textbooks will tell you four millimoles. Um, I see in the lab anything between sort of three and a half and six and a half. It really depends on the person's mm. training history and background. The one commonality is that we get a, a what we call a disproportionate increase of your ventilation to your oxygen consumption at this point. So if you ever look at a graph, it basically means that for the most part, ventilation is, um, if you look at these com like compared together, for the most part in a, in a VO2 max test, as intensity increases, there's a pretty linear relationship, so pretty equal relationship for the, those who don't really know the data side of things. But as exercise intensity increases, ventilation will increase pretty consistently. What we, what we get when we compare ventilation to oxygen consumption, so how much total air is coming in versus what is their actual usage of the oxygen out of that. We get to this point here at this anaerobic threshold or FTP or what do you like to call it, where you have a disproportional increase. Now, all of a sudden, the body's going into overdrive to significantly increase ventilation as, like we said before, as a response to this increasing blood lactate going up and up and up. But that increasing ventilation is not being met with an equal increase in oxygen consumption. Oxygen consumption kind of lags behind. We're just basically, we're smashing in a bunch of air Mm -hmm. And we can't necessarily use that equal amount. So what will so it just comes back here, out when we exhale? Yeah. So we'll, well, so no. So it potentially will come through the system, but what we're getting is at the couple of things. Either you're just breathing it back out. Right. So particularly when you get to high respiratory rates. So if you're breathing at sixty breaths per minute, for example, breath a second, you're going to be wasting some of that air that came in because it's just a byproduct. Yeah, just kind of going in so and quickly. out. Quickly. Yeah. Okay. Even if you're not though, even if it does, some of the oxygen gets into the bloodstream, gets out through the muscle. It's at these intensities where we're starting to get to a point where the body's like, I can't actually use too much uh, more oxygen. Okay. I don't have it. enough mitochondria. I don't have enough ability to actually get the oxygen into the muscle and use it to break down fuel to create aerobic energy. Mm -hmm. I need to try and increase the rate at which I can do it, but I, 
it's starting to get really difficult. And this is where we see a really significant increase in blood lactate because if the body can't use the oxygen to break down fuel to create energy, it needs energy from somewhere. Mm. So if I have to, if I'm trying to increase intensity, well, I'm going to produce a bit more anaerobic energy. Well, what does that do? That increases my blood lactate. So that's where, that's where I guess the term lactate inflection point comes into play is that if you look at a blood lactate graph, it's this, it's this curve. So it's just ticking along, ticking along. And then all of a sudden there's a point where it just shoots up through the roof. It, it like it goes from a very consistent graph to a very exponential graph very very quickly. That last point, so the last I guess flat ish point before it goes exponential, that is your VT one or VT two sorry or your LT two. Okay. Otherwise known as your, your functional threshold. So yeah. that that's then a really critical point because from endurance perspective, that is one of your bigger indicators when it comes to predicting performance. Typically, um, if you had lined up a bunch of athletes on a start line, whoever had the highest velocity, so pace, if you like, or speed at their lactate threshold or their functional threshold. Um, same goes for the bike. If whoever has the highest power output at FTP would have the best physiological chance of winning that race. If yeah. you took out all the other factors that go into racing tactics and the like and conditions, whoever has the highest functional threshold output is probably going to have the best chance of winning an endurance event. Because if they were to go a little bit harder when above that threshold, then the clock is ticking. They've got maybe 45 to 60 minutes. And if the race takes them longer than that, then they're done. Is that? Well, yeah. So if you, if you sit bang on out. your threshold, you, in theory, you're going to be, as long as you like train, train appropriately, in theory, you're going to be 60 minutes and done. So okay. if you're like, if we look at a 10K race, for the, for the typical amateur, it's probably somewhere between 45 to 60 minutes, realistically. Mm-hmm. So this is like a perfect scenario in terms of looking at threshold. How can the guys who run sub, like the Olymp- you look at the Olympic guys who run 10,000, they're running 26, 27 minutes. Mm-hmm. Well, the race is only 26 or 27 minutes, so they can afford to go well above oh, their threshold. Yeah, we, take, okay. we, take, we take the amateur who's running six-minute K pace at their threshold, so that would be a 10K in bang on an hour. Mm-hmm. You're probably... Like you, you, as soon as you tip over that six minute K pace, which would be a pace to run sub, sub an hour, 10 K, unless you, unless you had the physiology to be able to do it. So you trained and improved. If you were exactly the same, you'd blow up pretty quick. Mm-hmm. You'd, you'd get to the 8K mark and just plummet because you're just going too hard for what your body can handle. Okay. So that's where, that's where it's an important metric from a, from a, like a, a racing and practical perspective. Is it a go-to for me? Well, no, because majority of the majority of the training from an aerobic benefit perspective is going to come from your really long, slow stuff and your really top end stuff. Because as I said before, you, you can't have a really high threshold without having a really big aerobic engine. Okay. Yeah. Because it's 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 limited. If we're talking if we're talking this threshold point as being 45 to an hour in terms of time you could last, well, VO2 max is only five to seven minutes. If you do a hundred percent of VO2 max, mm-hmm. you probably only like la- the average person probably lasts five to seven minutes before they just okay. could not do any more. Right. And that's the same, like, and that's where we're talking 45 to 60 minutes until you could not do any more at that intensity. So you would have to reduce your intensity past that. There has to be a gap between these two points then. Mm-hmm. So there, there has to be spacing. And that's where if you want to improve something like a 10K, majority of the people that come in and see me, the first thing I'm looking at is, well, I'm not really worried about improving your threshold initially. Mm-hmm. It's improving your VO two max to allow you to improve your threshold. Threat like you, you can't like I said you you, you can't have a threat you can't have a ten k pace that exceeds your your two k yeah. pace. It just yeah, doesn't make if your sense. VO two max is the maximum you can sustain the maximum speed, whatever you're doing that you can sustain for what did you say four minutes five, five to seven minutes five to time, seven yeah. minutes then the speed that you can go for 45 to an hour is obviously going to be slower. <laughs> 100%, 100%. And that's really the key thing. It's like with, with a, lot of, a lot of training, and this kind of goes to training intensity distribution, a lot of particularly amateur, amateur athletes I see do a lot of more threshold-based training. It, mm. It's the most specific to things like 5, 10K type racing, maybe half marathon a bit as well. Um, the issue with it is that it's, it's limiting because – you can only continue to improve it to a point unless you go and move the upper limit. 
It's like yeah, if, I, I, if, I, I was, if I jump on a trampoline inside, I'm going to hit my head eventually on the roof. But if I move yeah. the roof, I've got more room to jump. And that's like I, I, as you know, I've been watching your YouTube videos for a while, but which are excellent. I'm going to link some in the show notes about uh, your explanations of zones and stuff were very, very helpful. But I recently found you have a podcast. So I was listening to a few episodes of that, which is excellent, very helpful. And something that I hadn't really thought about before that um, you and I'm sorry, I don't know your co-host's name. Yeah, Luke. Yep. Um, you guys were talking about this concept of the, the VO2 max kind of ceiling. And am I right in thinking, because this was somewhat new to me as well, that if you set your, um, I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm gonna go with um, power on the bike and you measure and the power at VO2 max is 300 watts. I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm just going to say it. And yep. then the threshold, so the V, sorry, the LT2. Correct. The, yep. the, that is at, let's say, 200 watts. I don't know if yep. that's reasonable, but that's where we're going to put it. Uh, yep. Let's we'll say 200. We'll just, we'll just put it there. Yep. Okay, 200. Now, if it's, it's always going to be a percentage of that top value. Yeah. But it'll. It, am I right in thinking that it can move? It can move closer to that top value, or it can move further away, um, depending on your training. Is that right? Hundred percent. And that that's where I guess the the mi big misconception is, and has been for a long period of time, is oh, you can't improve your VH max. I flat out flat out reject that that myth, because um, okay. you definitely can. And I've thousands of sets of data to show that it does um, in lots of different types of athletes, but you're right. So something, something like that's probably a perfect example, 300 Watts at VO2 max and someone's FTP at 200 would be quite a low percentage for what we okay. would see. Um, the average would probably be uh, probably be somewhere close to maybe 230, 240 as their, okay. their FTP. So 200 would be quite low. So in that circumstance, if I had that athlete come in and see me, I'd be going, let's go and work on this threshold. Like what is your ah, limiting factor okay. here? Threshold probably is reason being you've probably what, what that sort of tells me for where they're at, they've probably got a really well developed VO like VO2 max overall. Like their aerobic mm -hmm. is pretty good. Their limiting factor towards, particularly towards the end of the test, is like and practically in the field when they race, is that they're going to hit threshold really quick. So if they're going and doing a, let's say, like a, if they're road, they're a road cyclist and they do road racing, if they're sitting in a bunch, and their threshold's at 200, but the person next to them, even though they both might have the same VO2 max, the person next to them sitting at 240, well, old mate who's got 200 watts as his threshold, mm. he's going to be sitting in the pack struggling along. Locus in on 240 is going to be like, well, I'm at threshold or just sub-threshold. This is pretty comfortable for me. I can hold this for a long, longer period of time. Comes down to the sprint finish at the end. It's like, well, you can then pick who's going to who's going to likely win out of that. Who, the person who's fresh or the person who's fatigued. Well, pretty obvious decision um so in that circumstance i'd be going all right let's work more on threshold the typical one that we see though i, I would almost argue 85 to 95 90 percent of the clients that i see are the direct opposite okay. they'll be vo2 max of say 300 with an ftp of 240 250 i know so why much it's because they're doing most of their training near the threshold just above just below but they're not doing enough to improve their overall VO2 max and push the ceiling up. So they constantly have the same height of ceiling and they're just trying to move their threshold as close to that ceiling as they can, but they're not spending enough time trying to raise the ceiling. How do you raise the ceiling? <laughs> well, yeah, well, 100%. It's, and it's like I said before, that type of training is the most race or event specific because for okay. most of endurance athletes, they're the intensities you're working at some sort of tempo threshold mm -hmm. combination um, depending on the, the length of the event, of course. So it makes sense to do that train, but as you said, you got to be able to raise the ceiling to keep the progression going. So number one reason why athletes just plateau super quick is they just do the same thing again, again, again. Mm. Um, how we raise the ceiling is a combination of making sure you get your long, slow stuff nailed off, which majority of athletes are reasonably good at, but there's always that classic case of going too hard in the easy sessions. And then on the flip side, it's not going hard enough in hard sessions. Yep. And, and this is probably one of the biggest reasons why I always anchor everything off VO2 max mm -hmm. is that if you have a look at any research study done in high intensity interval training for the purposes of improving your aerobic power. So ultimately improving your VO2 max, it's all done as a percentage of VO2 max. Right. 
reason for that is because like, well, one, it just makes sense to be targeted. Like if we're targeting trying to improve our VO2 max, let's use that as our base metric. Where a lot of programming goes wrong that I see is that they use a percentage of FTP. Yeah. So like, like we just mentioned before, where we've got that case of like, you could have two athletes with the same VO2 max, but two different FTPs. Well, 120% of FTP, which is commonly used to prescribe these high intensity interval sessions to give these adaptations we're trying to get, for one athlete is potentially going to be way too hard. And for the other mm-hmm. one, it's not going to be hard enough. Ah, because and that's how far away from VO2 max they actually are. Yeah, because the, the VO2 max ceiling sets the ceiling. That's the size of your engine, mixing yep. my metaphors, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, yep. And since the um, percentage at which you hit threshold LT2 of that um, ceiling, let's say, varies from person to person, depending on their training and other factors, Correct. then if you use the LT, which is so, is a somewhat fluctuating value, LT2, as your starting point, then your prescription of training may not be what you think it is. You might think you're giving someone some VO2 max intervals, whereas actually they're too easy or they're too hard. Is that Okay. Pretty, pretty much because ah, really, like, realistically when it comes down to it the, the point of re- like really effective high intensity interval training the whole premise is maximizing time at vo2 max that that's written on every every paper and every textbook that that talks about how to execute high intensity interval training and, and receive the aerobic adaptation we're looking for is is maximize your time at vo2 max so it makes sense to anchor everything off the physiological intensity we know that is your VO2 max mm-hmm. <laughs> um, to prescribe yeah. the training. So, um, and, and that, like you said, because of that fluctuation in in someone's like FTP, for example, I mean, it, it becomes it becomes a bit of a guessing game, and that's where I mean, it's still going to be a hard session. One hundred and twenty percent of anyone's FTP is going to feel hard, but mm-hmm. if you actually needed to hit one hundred and thirty percent of your FTP, well, ten percent more is actually a very big jump in power mm-hmm. if you went and calculate back calculated that specifically you're like that's way different i mean yeah, if i was 300 I'm, watt athlete that could be like 20 30 watts which is a yeah. pretty massive difference or and maybe if you're, a if 30 you're talking, second increase in pace per kilometer yeah, or well, something if you're, like if, that. You're t- if you're talking like three minute intervals i mean holding i would i would from a easy perspective i'd much prefer to hold 240 watts than 270 watts for mm, three minutes yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's a very different training stimulus and ultimately a very different outcome in terms of adaptation down the track. So that's why that's why working a percentage of VO2 max for that stuff is is more the go. Um, because you, you, we know that, right, I could do efforts of one minute in length at 100% VO2 max with a one minute sort of, when I say passive recovery, it might be a very, very, very gentle spin, sort of less than 60 watt type stuff or a, or a walk. Um and that's going to help me accumulate time at VO2. Um, I could go 30 second on, 30 second off at 120% of VO2 max, so well above. But because I've got these like 30 second block of really hard, gets my oxygen consumption up quite quick, but then I'm off again. Mm-hmm. Once we get through four, five, six of those, if you look at a profile of someone's oxygen consumption, even in the rest periods, their oxygen consumption stays at VO2 if you do the session correctly. Mm-hmm. So, so that's where it's like we're almost using that metric, it's a much easier way to basically guarantee I'm getting time where I need to, to put the stress on the body I need to, to get the adaptation. Um, so it's just eliminating some of that, that guessing a bit. Yeah. Um, so not I to say that-, that FTP or an- anaerobic pressure or anything like that is not important. It definitely is. Yeah. It's just the only time I'll use that is to prescribe a session for that purpose. Yeah. If I want to improve threshold, well, I'll use percentage of threshold because it makes yeah, sense. Okay, I'm with you. Above and below threshold, that's how that's how we improve it. But if you want to improve VO2 max, max, you want to know what the VO2 max. max is and then yep. prescribe the session based on that. But, um, that sort of made me think a little bit about, because um, you know, often you hear this sort of phrase, the easy sessions aren't easy enough, the hard sessions aren't hard enough. And then I think sometimes, and I think I've been guilty of this too, you think, well, my my hard sessions are hard. <laughs> and I think that's not quite the right language because it's not that the session as a whole isn't hard. But if you're using, let's say, LT2 as your marker and maybe your VO2 max intervals aren't fast enough, then it's that the time that you're doing your interval, let's say the three or four minutes, that's not 
hard enough. That specific three or four minutes, you needed to be going harder to hit your VO2 max. So you might have been like close-ish. So overall, the workout is hard and it's a lot harder than let's say an easy day run, but it isn't that those few minutes aren't hard enough. And that's the reason why you want to use VO2 max um, heart rate, power and pace to anchor those sessions so you know that you're getting those few minutes hard enough. And then I think from what you were saying, the way to raise the ceiling on VO2 max is to have workouts that accumulate time at or above VO2 max. Would that be right? Pretty pretty much spot on. Like it, it, it's all about if you would actually do your training session, and this is what all the, the research on the topic does, it's if you put a mask on to measure your oxygen consumption during that training session, we should be seeing, all right, based on your previous testing, here's your VO2 max as an oxygen consumption number. We should be seeing you reach that and be able to have time spent at that across the session. Um, if you don't go hard enough, you're just not going not to get there. Um, you can manipulate your work to rest ratio. So you don't have to go at and above VO2 max in all your sessions. Like I prescribe 95, 92% of VO2 max quite a bit, but I manipulate the length of the interval. I manipulate the work to rest ratio. I manipulate the recovery type. If I do something like 95% of VO2 max, I'm more likely to prescribe a three or a four minute effort. If I've got a two minute effort, well, I'll bump the intensity up because there's not enough time in the effort to have everything lag up there in, in two minutes. Sorry, so, um, if you prescribe some intervals and mm -hmm. they're three minute long, and they're yep. at 95% of the power that you measured as their VO2 max power. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that during that three minutes, their heart rate will drift up to hit their VO2 max heart rate? And that's the physiological stimulus you're after. Is I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Yeah. So so in let, let's use let's use an example to to I guess make the whole concept because it can be a bit tricky where you because there is so many variables. If we use something like a three-minute effort. I would probably prescribe, yeah, somewhere between 90, 95, yeah, 95% of VO2 max for most people is a good starting point. In that first three-minute effort, probably only the last 30 seconds is kind of useful. The first oh, okay. really 90 seconds is just most, like if you have a look at a heart rate profile, it's just gradually coming up. The back end is, is probably the first occasion we hit time at VO2. So you look at that and go, well, why, why is that such an effective set of prescription? because we're not really caring about the first effort. It's then about the second effort, the third and the fourth. It's an okay. accumulating effect. What you'll see in really well-executed sessions is heart rate drift. So effort one, let's say use my numbers again. If I'm trying to get to like 196 is my VO2 max. My first effort might only get me to 188. I then have, I might do one to one work to rest ratio. So three minutes on, three minutes walk, for example. I jump into my second effort. My heart rate drifts up to 192. Jumping my third effort, my heart rate drifts up to 194. What that tells me is my body's constantly under, I guess, that it's constantly under a hard enough stimulus and it's constantly being challenged. And what you'll also notice is that that initial effort that only got to 188, well, my heart rate in the second effort, it got to 188 a hell of a lot quicker because mm -hmm. my oxygen consumption is already up because I've started the session. So it's, it's an accumulative effect. You can't just go in and do one single effort. And, and but again, there's, there's research on this. Like, well, why couldn't I just go and do seven minutes at 100% VO2 max session done? Happy days, mm -hmm. pack up. It doesn't. Why not? Well, it doesn't work <laughs> because if we okay. if we go up there, if I got 100% VO2 max, there's a great study that shows it versus 30 on 30 off. If I got 100% of VO2 max or even 95% of VO2 max for as long as I possibly can, even if you lasted like eight or nine minutes, you just absolutely buried yourself. And then you were completely exhausted at the end. You couldn't repeat that effort any further. It was one and done. You're probably only going to be able to get about three to four minutes of time at VO2. Ah, okay. So you have to have a of, tactic. Of actual time at VO2 is probably going to be somewhere between three and four minutes. Okay. If you were to do 30, like, and the, the study that I'm referring to was was one single for, uh, effort to complete complete fatigue or what we call volitional fatigue, so you can't do any more, versus 30 on 30 off, repeated as many times as possible until they then were exhausted and fatigued. The single effort group lasted a max of about 10 minutes and probably only accumulated, yeah, four minutes of time at VO2, maybe a bit more, but not much. The 30 on 30 off group was able to repeat that protocol for about 23 or 24 minutes. 
Wow. Out of that, out of that, they were able to accumulate about 16 minutes of time at VO2. Compared with how many minutes in the first group? Compared with about four. Right. Okay. And that's a fairly so, simple protocol. 30 on, 30 off. 30, 30 on, 30 on, 30 off. Because what, because what happened, particularly in 30 on, 30 off, it doesn't necessarily happen as much in the long interval. And this is where some of those factors come into it. But particularly something like 30 on, 30 off, the rest period isn't long enough to allow your oxygen consumption to drop too far. Mm-hmm. If you think about doing 30 on 30 off, it's like the first effort you go, you're like, oh, that was pretty hard. 30 off. Okay. After a couple, you're like, I feel like I need more rest. Like this is, this is getting difficult. That was you a don't quick feel, 30 seconds. <laughs> you're like, yeah, correct. It's that, it's that, nah, nah, 30 seconds is enough. Surely. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still feeling hard. You look at the oxygen consumption profile on that oxygen consumption after sort of probably if you're executing it well, effort five onwards in that, that sort of protocol that we're talking about where you're just going and going and going forever. After about efforts five, six, seven, oxygen consumption was at VO2 max. From there until the person just could not complete the protocol anymore, it did not move. Ah. So even in the recovery period, we're still spending time pretty close, if not bang on VO2 because the body doesn't want to keep bouncing. It goes, oh, we're going to repeat this protocol again. Well, I'll keep my oxygen consumption up because I've only got 30 seconds before I have to go again. And that additional ex- oxygen consumption in the recovery period is helping me recover from that previous effort. Oh, okay, right. So yeah. be, because like we said before, ventilation and oxygen consumption is a combat to lactic acid production. Yeah. So realistically what we have is it's the accumulative effect, particularly in short intervals like 30 on, 30 off, not just of the effort time itself, but actually the recovery periods become part of the time at VO2. Not quite the case in something like a three or a four minute type effort but definitely the case in those shorter ones. So, so that's where it, it's really important to get that prescription right because, I mean, you could go and do three, if you went and did three minute on, three minute off, or even if you did 30 second on, 30 second off, where well, we know it's really effective, the recovery is still giving us some bonus time towards the back end of the session, but you're not going anywhere near hard enough. Mm-hmm. Well, you'll be like, you'll get through it and you'll be like, oh, 30 on 30 off. I feel like I could do 15 of those. And I had a mm-hmm. client actually, I jumped on a call with one the other week talking about um, they did three sets of like 12 or 15, 30 on 30 offs in a single session. I went, that is crazy volume. What was mm-hmm. your power? Sure enough, they're only at like, they're, they're doing percentage of FTP. They were only ended up being about 90% of their VO2 yeah. max. So it's, a th- it's like a if- threshold session rather than a VO2 max session is kind of not not really like it kind of wasn't really doing it they're like oh okay. it, just feel, it feels like pretty comfortable and i'm like well if we're looking at actual prescription of that if you wanted 30 second on 30 second off completely you didn't want to have to pedal in that 30 second off you would have to go 120 percent of your vo2 max <laughs> mm-hmm. to be able to get the oxygen consumption we need or the intensity we need to boost oxygen consumption up so compare that to if like i mean we, we could be talking the difference here for some people based on that example I just gave, it, it I can't remember the exact numbers for that, that case, but it could have been something like they were doing 270 watts and they should have been doing 330. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. I mean, that's a massive difference. So that, I think, simulates a question that might be uh, sort of playing in the back of listeners' minds is, mm-hmm. okay, so you're 100% of VO2 max, the maximum amount of oxygen you can utilize in a minute. And you, we know what your heart rate, your pace, and your power is at that level. That gives us that VO2 max marker. That's that marker that we're looking at. But you just mentioned 120% of that. So this isn't the point at which you can't run any faster or bike any harder. This is the point at which you can't process any more oxygen. But you Correct. can actually go faster. Um, so physiologically speaking, how do you do that? So, but the, the really simple thing to, to think about is at VO2 max, so whatever intensity, let's say it's 300 watts on the bike. At that point, that is the maximal, uh, I guess, aerobic ability that your body's got. Mm-hmm. So at that point, you are using completely dominantly aerobic. Like, yes, there's an anaerobic contribution because we know there's a bit of blood lactate coming in, but you are more so aerobic than you are anaerobic. Mm-hmm. At no point in time you, are you ever one or the other. There's, it's not a flip switch. Yeah. Everything's working at all times. Um, so at your VO2 max, that is the maximal aerobic contribution you can make. If I increase intensity beyond VO2 max, to do that, I need to increase my anaerobic contribution to supply the extra. 
to top yeah. me up. That's why you can have someone who has a VO2 max of 300, but their five second sprint is 1200. The anaerobic. Right. <laughs> That's quite a difference. <laughs> like, well, absolutely. There's a, there's a massive difference. It's why, it's why um, you look at track cycles at the Olympics, they'll put out two and a half thousand watts. Right. I mean, it's, they're not holding. They're not holding it for very long. They're holding it for seconds. <laughs> That's predominantly anaerobic, but right. it's the type of thing. Anything past VO VO two max, you can keep going up and up in intensity. You just have to increase your anaerobic contribution. That's only sustainable for certain periods of time. Like I can't hold fifteen hundred watts or thousand watts forever. Probably like a few seconds. Or, is that what we're talking or, about? Yeah, two or three seconds, and then I'll start oh, to okay. drop down. Yeah, based on then how you train, that's going to change it. We probably won't touch on the anaerobic side of things too much, but. Where something like 120% of VO2 max, people might look at that and go, well, that's anaerobic. Why would that give me an aerobic training stimulus? It is anaerobic in the sense that we have to increase our anaerobic contribution. But like 120, 120% of VO2 max, like if I just quickly do some numbers so I actually get the, uh, the maths right, because I think it's a really important point to highlight. 120% of 300 watts is 360 if we're trying to produce 360 watts, you can buy, you could very simply, it's not quite right, but you very simply think of that as the first 300 watts is aerobic. Mm -hmm. The next 60 watts is the anaerobic contribution. So out of that session, I'm still very, very dominantly aerobic. There is a high need to use oxygen. Mm -hmm. The reason we have to go so far above is because we're also only on for a 30 second period. So I need to try and get my oxygen consumption up as quick as possible. What's the right. easiest way to do that? I put myself into what we call an oxygen deficit and the biggest oxygen deficit I can Yeah. because okay. the body doesn't like it. An oxygen deficit is just my exercise intensity is really high. My yeah. oxygen supply is not meeting that demand just yet. I'm in a deficit. Once I equal that demand, I hit a steady state. And that's what you've experienced in your long sustained stuff. Heart rate doesn't move. Mm -hmm. I'm running along at five minute Ks. My heart rate is exactly the same. That's where supply and demand are equal. Mm -hmm. So in a 30 second on 30 second off, we move to 120% to really maximize that deficit. Initially, it forces oxygen consumption to really try and come up, mm -hmm. but it's not long enough that we're just now accumulating too much fatigue. We then yeah. cut it off. We have yeah. a break, we then go again. So now that deficit is actually shortened a bit because we're starting from a slightly elevated oxygen consumption because 30 seconds isn't long enough for it to come down, like we said before. Yeah. We repeat it again and again and again by effort. Like I said, six, seven, eight in a set. You might do a set of 10 by 30 on 30 offs. It's really efforts, efforts four and above, five and above that oxygen consumption will just go, nah, I'm not going to do this bouncing up and down. I'm just going to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that 120% doesn't mean we're going anaerobic, so to speak. Yes, there's an anaerobic contribution to it, but it's still largely aerobic That's yeah because you I had to hit the first get. like you said you had hit the first 300 with your aerobic system Correct. and then you just 60 was just it was just so that you had a target so you made sure you got the 300 and yep. you didn't set it at 2000 because then you wouldn't be able to do very many and spend exactly. very much time there so it's that sort of balance between being able to go and do it again and again and again and get uh, i think you said like 16 minutes of time at that 300 watt vo2 max versus yeah tapping out because you went too hard or not actually spending any time there because you used the wrong um, milestone or, or marker to, to dictate how hard you went. Yeah, and, and that's where all these factors in terms of these sessions, into like factors like your work-to-rest ratio is really important. I mean, I can do 30 on 30 off, so a one-to-one -one, work to rest ratio. And it's a short, in, it's considered a short interval, 30 seconds. So what I need to make sure my oxygen consumption gets up there is a higher intensity. If I then go, all right, what about a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio for three minute on three minute off? Well, good luck trying to sustain 120% of your max mm -hmm. for three minutes in a single bout, let alone multiple. Mm -hmm. Remembering that it's not one effort. We're talking about the accumulation of a session. That's really the golden part. So 95, maybe 97 percent of VO2 max is more appropriate there if I have a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio. Alternatively, I might go, all right, maybe I want a two-to-one work to rest ratio. So three minute on 90 seconds off, but I'm going to go a slightly lower intensity. So I might go 95% of VO2 max for three minutes, have a 90 second walk and then back on. I don't need to go as hard. As, like if I'm doing one-to-one, -one, I might go 97%. If I'm going two-to-one, I might go 95. I don't need to go as hard because what's going to help keep my oxygen consumption up to get 
me through that initial bit and then up to our time of VO2 max in that next effort is the fact that I've had a shorter recovery. Right, okay. Not as much yes. time for it to come down. So that's yeah. where, it, I think that's where as well, a lot of people get a bit caught up in and a bit almost overwhelmed by how many variables go into yeah. this to make it really effective. Particularly then as well, when you, when you are guessing that intensity piece, it's like, well, how, how hard is actually 120%? Is it the equivalent of 90%? Because I don't really know my VO2 max. Is it not? So does that mean I can have mm. a one-to-one? Does that mean I need to have a passive recovery? So I'm just sitting there or standing there, not really doing anything or maybe a very light walk. Or do I have to run it? Or do I have to do a bit of a jog in my recovery to, to keep oxygen consumption? Like what is all of these become so difficult to work out when you don't have that key anchor point of well, we know definitively that for these length efforts, we need these ideal intensities. For the, these shorter efforts, we need these ideal intensities. Um, and, and once you can establish those and it's, all right, I'm going longer efforts and I'm going 95%, here are my options for recovery, here are my options for type of recovery, active or passive. How, how much volume can I do in a session? All of that then becomes a very simple Right, it's it's follow the flow chart down, mm-hmm. but getting to that point initially without knowing what that VO two max is probably the what that VO two max intensity is is probably the hardest part, and that yeah. that's where I I sort of go, for the most part, a lot of zone systems that work off threshold I think are probably missing the boat a yeah. bit because this really is where most people are going to get the greatest benefit to their aerobic engine. Could you then instead, two things spring to mind. One Mm -hmm. would be to use RPE. So a one to 10 scale where 10 is just as hard as you can possibly manage and nine is like pretty much that and so on. Um, Would using that rather than any, say you didn't know your VO2 max power or pace or heart rate and you wanted to make sure that your interval training was raising your VO2 max. Could you just use how hard it feels? So say that you you said um, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. So you might give an RPE of 10. Means that 30 seconds is as hard as you possibly can manage. And then you could have a 30 second at RPE 4. Where you, it, it's, it's, it's sort of... Some, does that work or is that too determined by the person's... Um, personality and perception and, and mood that day. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think something that, um, and a, a comment you made before sort of put this in my mind, and I think this is a perfect point to bring it in, around that point on not hard enough in these in these so-called hard sessions. It, it's, well, what's your definition of hard? Mm. For, the, for the type of stuff that I do personally, my definition of 10 out of 10 hard is maximal sprint. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that might be, 30 to 35 kilometers an hour. I'm only going to hold that for a short period of time. Yeah. If I then get one of my triathletes, well, their definition of 10 out of 10 hard might might be that 120% of VO2 max, which for them might only be, let's say one of my better train guys might be 22, 23 kilometers an hour. That's a very big discrepancy in terms of if you then provided the same session to those two people Mm -hmm. and asked them to go at a 10 out of 10. We've got very, very, like we've got one yeah. athlete who's definitely going to blow up after two efforts and not be able to do any more. And we've got one who's probably going to sustain it and nail the session. So RPE, RPE is okay. It's okay. like good in theory, the back, but does it work in practice? It's, 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 good, like. it's good in theory, but then it's the same thing as the 220 minus your age thing I brought up earlier. Why not just go and do a quick field test to know? Okay, so... I mean, um, like, so, so yeah, and I guess like, so my, my point on that would be something like from a running perspective... The best correlation to to a, to, uh, to a VO2 max intensity is going to be some, it's going to be a time trial somewhere between 1.6 to two kilometers long. Mm-hmm. Um, we're really looking we we really looking for something ideally probably eight minutes. Eight minutes would be max. And and the reason I say that is because if you're, for example, if you're someone who maybe goes through a 2k time trial in 10 minutes you probably have, because you've lasted 10 minutes, you probably actually weren't working at VO2 max. You're probably working just sub. There are some equations that you can use to, um, like regression equations to be able to, I guess, take out a bit of the the, the inaccuracy, so to speak. It's not a great great word for it, but a little bit of variation based on, all right, are you good at pacing your time trial or not? There, there's some things you can do, but 
somewhere between a 1.6 and 2K from a research perspective has a, a very good relationship with, with your VO2 max intensity. It's a, it's a much better starting point because all else fails, if you go, all right, I did a 2K and let's say my tire, my, my pace, my average pace over two kilometers came out to be four minute K pace. Mm-hmm. If you go and jump into a session and go, all right, I'm going to run at 95% of that, which off the top of my head is probably going to be somewhere between 4.12 and 4.10-ish pace. Um, I'm going to do my three-minute on, three-minute offs. If you get through that session and you go, well, I could have done like six or seven of those and pretty comfortable. All right, well, potentially we just underestimate a little bit. So Mm. next session, let's just bump up the intensity. And you will very quickly find the tipping point. And, And like I said, we're looking for a bit of heart rate drift across each interval, there's signs that you can then use to then go, am I actually working hard enough or have I underestimated a bit because I didn't time trial well or all of that. So so from a running perspective, a 1.6 to a 2K time trial is perfect. Okay. From a cycling perspective, most majority of cyclists would have done... So, sorry, can I stop you? Before yeah, you just move okay. on there, you would do that one, let's say two because it's easy to remember, two-kilometer yep. time trial running and then you want to make sure you warm up and and, and start off Correct. running when you start your watch so that when you look yep. at it afterwards, you can take your average pace and your average heart rate, and that's going to be a reasonably good approximation of your VO2 max pace and VO2 max heart rate. Is that right? Yeah, I, I would probably be taking – I'd probably be more – average heart rate in a 2K is probably – like it would be pretty good to look at, but I would probably be more inclined to look at – like how the, the, it's probably a bit complex. I would look at a bit more of the relationship between maximum heart rate and average heart rate in that bout. That, okay. that, that That's probably going a bit too far. I'd probably more use that 2K to prescribe your interval stuff off. Yes. Um, and like I said before, if you're looking at then trying to get, like if you were trying to get it and bootstrap it without, without doing lab testing and you wanted your VO2 max pace, I'd go and do the time trial. And then if you wanted your long, slow heart rate, like that VT1 we're talking about, Mm -hmm. um, I would probably then, I'd probably then more likely take your maximum heart rate from a 2 k That's going to be a lot closer to your your genuine maximum heart rate than um, than like say average. Because average is going to account for like the first 400, your heart rate might be 20 or 30 beats lower than what your max is, given that you're just settling into that activity. Okay, I think um, if I can try and make an example to help illustrate this. So let's say I did my 2K time trial. We'll take uh, my average pace was four minutes per kilometer. So now I know my VO2 max pace. Mm -hmm. And as you said, intervals, typically we will want to prescribe by pace, not heart rate, because heart rate takes a while to get up and it's not long enough. Um, But I also want to know my VT1 heart Mm -hmm. rate. And you said heart rate because that's a better metric for physiological load and stimulus. Um then pace, for example, which is may vary depending on how you're feeling, how much you've slept, all that kind of stuff. So for our low end stuff, we want to use heart rate. How do you get from, so I then look at, okay, I did my 2K time trial. I have a look at my data afterwards. The max my heart rate hit was uh, 185. Yep. And I'm going to take that as my max heart rate rather than using 220 minus my age because that's... Yep. Um, not always very accurate. So now I've got 185, I've got my max heart rate, I've got my VO2 max pace. How do I get from a 185 max heart rate to know what my VT1 is or, or L, uh, LT1 slash yeah, VT1? LT1, yeah, yeah. So but yeah, the, to- the top end of your longest slow stuff. For the most part, it- it's going to vary a bit based on the, the the calculator that you might use or the set of zones that you might use. For the most part, it's going to be about like I mean, conservatively, if you were eighty percent of that one eighty five, it's probably going to be there and thereabouts. The difficulty you face here is that you don't have you don't have the data to know what your VT one is. Mm-hmm. That's that's probably the biggest advantage of a lab test is that you can objectively say that is where my ventilation yep. increased as a response. Um, we are we're, we're taking an educated guess here rather than a flat out guess. That, yeah. That's kind of how we're improving it. So, um, yeah, some, somewhere eighty to eighty five percent of your maximum heart rate gen generally is going to be a pretty good rule. Mm-hmm. Um, keep in mind that is of your heart rate. Yep. Percentage of max heart rate and percentage of VO two max are offset scales. 
that's the other like so your maximum heart rate won't necessarily occur at your vo2 max the reason for that is because like we said before is that yep. like you're going to have this increase in oxygen supply to try and meet the demand so if you in theory kept running it faster and faster and faster and faster and faster for as long as you possibly could if there was no ability for you to fatigue at all and you could actually just keep running faster your heart will keep beating faster and faster and faster and faster until something stops ah didn't know that okay. because all it's all it's trying to do is just supply more oxygen if i increase the demand well my mm. heart rate's going to go through the roof trying to supply the oxygen my my limiting factor though is that we know that at some point we will fatigue yeah. So I cannot keep going faster and faster forever. I'm eventually going to hit that upper limit. And what that upper that upper limit, whatever it might be, I might be well and truly anaerobic. Like you can go and go and run a 400 mm-hmm. as hard and as fast as you can. You will get your heart rate in a very short period of time to very high numbers. Right. If you genuinely are going purely from the fact that you're trying to supply the oxygen, but you can't because you're at a workload significantly above VO2 max. Yeah. You can supply it to a point, but I can only supply so much oxygen but the body will try. Yeah, <laughs> It will try to supply more and more and more. So that's where you'll commonly see maximum maximum heart rate will be at a slightly higher intensity. When I say intensity, slightly higher power or slightly higher pace mm-hmm. than what your VO2 max occurs at. Yeah. You were just saying that that 2K time trial, probably at some point you'll hit a heart rate that's pretty damn high and pretty close to your, not, I, your actual. I would say... Yeah, because yeah. if you if anyone who's done a two k who's who might be listening is like sort of thinking through this, like if you've done a two k, you'll know that once you get to that last sort of four hundred meters, you are starting to feel a real burn going through mm-hmm. the legs. Like it is getting hard. So not only we're we trying to supply oxygen to continue the output and continue you running at that pace, or maybe even lift the intensity a bit to to come in strong, you're also now trying to supply oxygen and and pump some blood around the system to try and manage and combat some of that acidity that's coming in from the, the anaerobic contribution, that lactic acid production. Um, so that's where, yeah, by the end of it, my, most people who might only in a normal circumstance, if they do a 2K time trial properly, they might only see their heart rate get to like mid 180s. You might actually find it gets to those high 180s by mm-hmm. the end of it. Yep. Throw, okay. in, throw in hot conditions, that then changes it again. But um, that yeah, that's, that's where I'd probably more likely take your maximum heart rate from that. Um, And if you were purely just looking at, I just want to know my heart rate, well, you could, like I said, you can shorten up the test even further and just go as hard as 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 you can. can Basically, as hard as you you can can for as long as you can, really. Like, so four minutes, probably enough. And just see what heart rate comes out to be. That's going to be a pretty good indicator. Yeah. Like, I've done that on my bike before. Like, I'll say, oh, going up into the 180s. uh, Let's just see how high I can make it going. (laughs) And and that's not a bad... Until you test... uh, yeah, until you test it, you're not going to know, are you? And yeah. that's why it's such a guessing game. And it, I guess to, to cover off on the point we talked about with um, like knowing how hard enough to go, until people know what their VO2 max is, until you go and do that 2K time trial, you don't really have a gauge mm-hmm. of how hard is hard. Yeah. And until you go and do these high-intensity interval training sessions correctly, should I say, yeah. you're not really going to know. Yeah, like if you were doing them way too easy without knowing and now you, you work out what the pace is, you go and jump in, you're going to be like, okay, I have a different definition of 10 out of 10 now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's I call it RPE miscalibration. I've sort of coined that term over the years because yeah. it, it, it can be so different between people. And I've noticed particularly like youngsters, like younger kids, that they, <laughs> they give you really weird scores when you ask them how hard they're working and they're sort yep. of barely jogging. And they're like, this is a nine. And it's, you yeah. know, it can be all of I just plugged in one eight five times uh, 85% though, and it's 148, which I think would be a, reasonable so that for me could be a reasonable guess at my heart rate um at lt1 so now i've got a vo2 max pace i've got an lt1 heart rate now i'm starting to understand and i know you've got to go so i want to try and wrap this up because we haven't talked about trade exhaust yet <laughs> that's right, that's right. We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, but this uh, i think we can try the nice thing is here we're talking about physiological metrics and intensities and that's really what we want to understand and then whatever number you call different sections of that spectrum is it's up to you whatever training plan you like 100 percent. so well, now we've got a vo2 a- max at one end and then we've got anaerobic above it we've got lt1 at the other end we know that now um so what about lt2 can we determine that on our own should we or not um 
that's probably the when I say that's probably the the more widely tested or field tested uh, metric. As we said before, for most people, it's probably going to be their 10k for the average. Yeah, you know, go out and do a 10k time trial. Is is if it falls somewhere, so that 45, 60 minutes, you probably have a pretty good idea. Yeah, um, that's an something easy like way a, to something do like it. 5k. Most people would probably use that as a bit of a guide. Uh, 5k typically is going to be just above threshold maybe 105, 110%, again, depending on the person. So if you had a spread of intensities, though, like if you went and did a 5K time, if you did a 2K time trial, you went and did a 5K and you went and did a 10K, like you're going to have you're going to have a reasonable amount of data to be able to go, okay, I think I have a pretty good idea of where threshold might be, um, particularly as well if you're a faster 10K. So like if you're sub 45 minutes, it's probably going to be a little, like your actual threshold is probably going to be a little bit, um, but a little bit different to someone who, if you're bang on six minute K pace for a 10 K, well, that probably is going to be yeah. exactly what your threshold is. Um, so, so that's where, I mean, in theory, go out and do an hour time trial. <laughs> like, you know, it's not the most, it's, it's not the most fun thing. Um, a lot of people, particularly cyclists, would do the 20 minute and take 95% of that. Um, the only thing I don't like with that, and I had a chat with a, a um, coach the other day who, who got their athlete to do it and, he made the he made the common mistake of putting into the athlete's mind a, a reasonable target of intensity that he could hold. So what the athlete do jumped on the bike and held exactly what his coach told ah, him to. Okay. So that's so that that's where I mean something like a twenty a twenty minute time trial can be a bit misleading as well because like in theory the the point of a time trial is you go as hard and as fast as you can for that given time. Like it's mm-hmm. maximal it's a maximal test. Um, for that that time period so that's where it can be a bit misleading i yeah i, I would sort of for most people yeah something like for the bike 20 minute 95 percent is pretty good as long as you as long as you go as hard as you can okay um or, or use some of those more like use some race some race data that you might have or event data so if it's a 10k or a 5k and and adjust it accordingly um that, what do that's you probably, think that's probably of- my, my my biggest tip there because it, it's going to fluctuate that's the hard part yeah and it'll change over the course of a year probably because we talked about that it'll move up and down whereas the the vo2 max is only going to move if you really do it properly which we've talked about mm-hmm. the what do you think like uh my garmin has it i've never tried it but it has a test your lactate threshold setting i think zwift has some different lactate threshold um or lt2 let's try and be specific yep um tests what do you think of those are they worthwhile um will, will yeah, you think, get yeah. misleading data from them um I, I think i mean with anything like particularly with the stuff on on your watch um some of those you always have to be a bit skeptical about because they're always they're like i mean anything where it's a calculation based number it, it's always going to be there's always going to be a, a greater percentage of inaccuracy oh no sorry um, um something yes I, I know so, they do have uh uh settings to calculate it but i I was thinking more that um they have field tests baked into them i don't know if you um, yeah yeah like i said i've never tried them but i just have seen them and i'm aware that zwift has them as well although i haven't done it myself yeah and and that's where i mean even even then like i I haven't used the the gum one specifically but where i'm sort of more talking about is like even something like zwift like from from my knowledge the ones on zwift it's still like it's still going to be it's still going to be a calculation of sorts. Like if you go, okay. and do, if you go and do a twenty minute, it's going to be ninety five percent of your twenty minute power. Yeah. So we're still calculating. Like, was it actually ninety six percent of your twenty minute power? Like, I know that's being a bit technical, but that could make a significant difference. So you might um, be better off going for look. You need to do an hour's time trial <laughs> in some way. I mean, like, if, whether if you, that's if a you actually, or... if you actually wanted to be a hundred percent sure that you knew what it was, <laughs> like an hour time trial is fundamentally the definition of threshold okay um we we come up with these shorter tests or alternative tests um as a means of getting around that i mean in our lab circumstance we're lucky because we directly measure blood lactate and we have the oxygen consumption data and the ventilation so we can pinpoint it there from a physiological perspective field testing regardless of the test you do it's always going to be tricky because like i said even with a 2k if you're looking at vo2 max if you're a if you're an endurance runner and you're really good at pacing yourself probably get through that 2k pretty pretty well you'll know how hard to go out and how strong to come home if you're a soccer player and all you do is stop start unless Mm. someone gives you some guidelines on like all right what have you done before and like how 
how fast we think we can go and things like that and what pace to run maybe each lap or a target lap time. Majority of the time, you're going to go out way too hard and blow up and you're going to have a slower time than what you physiologically actually could output or you're going to not go out anywhere near hard enough and you're going to waste time because you didn't go out anywhere near hard enough. So th- there's always going to be an element of error to field testing. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it's, a means, it's a means to an end. It's just the, the point of all doing any of any of these field tests is just if we can remove at least part of the guessing, yeah, we're, we're ticking a lot of boxes. It's never going to be a hundred percent ideal bulletproof, and, and yeah. I would I would never solely rely, and even on like lab data as well. Like I mean, I'd never solely rely just on lab or field testing data. Yeah. A bunch of my my athletes who come in, they'll come in a lab, and it's a classic what we call white coat effect. They'll come in and just crumble because they're a bit stressed out. They yeah. they want to get a better result, and they're so focused about that, and there's equipment and masks on them and, and a whole bunch of stuff they go out three days later and do a 2k time trial and they're absolutely monstrous <laughs> like all right now i need to look at right was their oxygen consumption data doing why is this different what's their running economy like because that's mm. now playing a big factor in terms of all right my lab numbers might translate to the field reasonably well until a particular intensity but there's clearly something happening so that, that's where i mean like it, it almost as long as you're using some form of test that that has been wide, like reasonably widely adopted and, and I guess respected as a valid test, um, you, you're probably going to be okay. But for something like threshold, I'd, I'd be more inclined to use, like I said, race or event data of mm-hmm. events in similar So for a runner, it's probably going to be five or 10K. Yeah. Um, at like 5K, all right, your 5K time and your average pace for your 5K is probably just a bit faster than threshold. So maybe yep. adjust it back by five or so percent. Yep. It's gonna be pretty good. Yeah. Um, very. Yeah. Very. Very rarely. Um, like commonly, I'll ask clients what their five k time is before I chuck them on the treaty in, in a lab testing situation, and and very rarely is that five k dramatically okay. like miles apart from their actual threshold. It's yeah. it perfectly okay. fits just above that threshold. Yeah. Ninety five percent of the time. Okay. Um, so so, so that's, maybe that can be a good one. Your average pace for your average pace heart rate for your 10k uh, yep. or 95 percent of that for your 5k it's not a bad starting point but you have to appreciate that there's maybe a fair amount of error in that one um absolutely but obviously it depends, if on, we, it depends on what you've trained for as well like if you haven't been training for a 5k and you've been training for marathons well your 5k is probably not going to be anywhere near as good as if you went and did a you were a 5k only runner so so keep that in mind as well it's mm, like okay. if you're purely a 5k runner well I'm probably actually running a fair bit above threshold, but if I'm like, for, if you're a marathon runner, it, a 5k might be a bit closer to your threshold because your five mm. and 10 could be a, a lot similar pace. So again, mm. fluctuating. So yeah, I see what you there, there's, a, there's some ideas anyway. I mean, there, there's so many different tests you can use, but I, I mean, like the main, the main things, uh, if you can get VO2 max and you have a reasonable idea of where your threshold, or your, your, your FTP is or your, um, your LT2 and you have a reasonable idea of where your LT1 is, you, you're well and truly on the way. If you can have access to lab testing, that, that I mean, that's that's your ideal. Yeah. Like it, it, it just pinpoint, you take out all of that that guessing Yeah. and you're like, well, this this is objectively where my numbers fall. Like yeah. that's the bonus of it. But obviously lab testing is one of those things that depending on where you are in the world, it can be a bit difficult to get to. So having some alternatives, I mean, is going to get you majority of the way there. I think as well, if you are interested in having lab testing done, I think, I mean, I've learned a lot in the last, I've had eight ages, an hour and a half, you know, <laughs> talking yeah. about this stuff. So trying to understand actually, what are these thresholds talking about? So now I think if, you know, I can go back, listen to this episode, LT1, LT2, VO2 max, I know what all those are. I know how they relate to my physiology. So let's bring it all home. What's this got to do with trade exhorts? <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, to ba- basically, your point there, it's like, I have these three points. And to touch on really the first thing we, we talked about at the beginning was um, like, like, what are the, where do I anchor things from? Those three points are the commonalities across every set of training zones that you'll ever see. Right. They, you will find, like, I use a five zone system, I use it as a starting point. We have zone one is active recovery, which we use 56% of VO2 max or less. Uh, I'll, I'll keep that out of it just for now. That's like very rarely would I give someone zone one. It's basically a walk. It's a very, very okay. light, light spin, 10, 15 minutes and we're done. 
that I, I very rarely sort of actually prescribe it. It's kind of something that just happens. Zone two is our, uh, really everything active recovery up to our VT1 that we talked about before. Zone three is VT1 to VT2. So yep. simple, it blocks all of our threshold tempo, all of that race specific gray zone type stuff. It's really, really good for event specificity, but not great for aerobic captation. Bundles it all into one. VT2 up to VO2 max is what we call zone four. So that's our predominantly our long interval type range, three minute, four minute, 95% of VO2 max type stuff we said. And then anything above 100% of VO2 max, we just term it as zone five because and it's an open-ended zone because it just depends on what what is our goal of that session. Is our goal to be better at um, uh, have a better VO2 max? We're doing 30 on 30 offs. That's well above VO2 max, we're not 120%. Or is our goal to do maximal sprinting type stuff? All of that is things like heart rate that become irrelevant because the further you go past VO2 max, the more anaerobic it gets and the, lo- the, the less likely you're going to be able to last for a long period of time. If I take those exact same three points and I apply it to a three zone system, well, now it's really simple. It's anything less than VT1 is zone, zone one. Between VT1 and VT2 is zone two and anything above VT2 is zone three. Cool. We're just, we're just, we're just kind of saying that, well, VO2 max happens somewhere in zone three, but we're giving it a bit more of a continuum to work along for all of those types of efforts that I would normally use as zone four and five to yeah. maybe split and give a bit more, I guess, a, a separation to a three zone system works really well for people who have no idea what's going on with zones. It keeps it super simple, but also things like team sport athletes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you have athletes who don't normally go and run, run with a GPS watch or run with a heart rate on. It makes it super simple. They're like, well, I need to stay below this number for my easy sessions. And I need to make sure I'm going this hard, at least this hard for my hard sessions. Really simple, but it's yep. the same three physiological points. You can map that out to seven zones. We commonly, um, have to do the conversion to Garmin zones. I mean, they use a slightly different five zone system. Basically, Garmin just kind of splits our zone three in half, scraps zone five and splits our zone three in half and goes, this is more tempo, this is more threshold. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. That's just semantics. <laughs> yeah, You still have those three points. It's just under if you can understand where really that top end of your, when I say the top end of your long slow, as you tip into, all right, I'm becoming a bit more of a tempo style session rather than a really good aerobics session. As we said, that VT1, if you know where that is, if you know where your VT2 or your functional threshold is and you know your VO2 max, if you can look at a set of zones and go, all right, what do all these zones mean? Find their definitions. That's where VT1 fits. That's where VT2 fits. And that's where VO2 max fits. It does not matter what number of zones you use that that becomes personal preference and it becomes what makes sense to you. I have some clients who like to use 11 zones because they want to be really, really like, all right, I've got 10 beats mm-hmm. per minute here to work in. They're very precise with that. Cool. doesn't work for everyone. I, I probably wouldn't choose that, but if that's what's going to get them to jump in that session and nail it, happy days. That, that's well, your, your 11 zones would be like one beat each or so. Oh, yeah, my, my, <laughs> I, it's just not practical for me to do 11 zones. It just doesn't work <laughs> in my case. Um, but like well, that that's where for me, it, like I, I use a five commonly for, for a lot of the stuff I do when I'm working with clients. But to be completely honest, from a from a training perspective, my own actual training, I very rarely do any stuff in the middle. So a three zone system makes a lot more sense yeah. to me. Mm-hmm. All my easy stuff is below a, below said heart rate. One, what did we say before? 170, 175. Yeah. And then I know where my VO2 max is and I prescribe my high intensity sessions based off that. Yeah. I don't need to be just the nature of my sport. I'm never running for anything more than about three minutes continuously there's always a break so i don't need to do that tempo threshold stuff so three zones make sense because yep. then it's like well i need zone one i need zone three and i don't need zone two <laughs> happy like it, it works um but yeah for for those who maybe need some of that in between and want to distinguish well what's the difference between tempo and threshold and then and and understanding different types of sessions what's the difference between over and unders and what's the difference between sweet spot type training and hard and like, go nuts but at the end of the day like as complex as you make it for yourself or easy you're still finding those three points yeah and i think that yeah that's a really lovely helpful summary and that's really exactly what i wanted to try and um 
discussed it in and why I was hoping to get you on to talk about it because that does really now you understand what the zones are for now you can look for those three points within whatever zone system you know you might be reading about at the time um you know because there's different methods and then but if you look at it then you can understand how they've made their zones in relation to these three points and you also give us some reasonably good um ways that if we can't do lab testing which would obviously be better to just tell us what our three zones are but if you want to try and estimate uh, a reasonably good estimate on your own you can do the 2k time trial you can find an estimate of your max heart rate by either using that test or just going up a hill as hard as you can for as long as you can (laughs) or uh, and then uh, some kind of threshold test for lt2 might be like a 10k recent race if you're somewhere in the ballpark of an hour that's probably reasonably close and now we not only know what the three points are that we're looking for in the zones we have a reasonable way to actually estimate them for ourselves and that's incredibly helpful (laughs) i will link to um the the videos that you talked about this that i was mentioning there there was a few and i'll I'll put those in because they have illustrations which will be helpful for those who are listening to if they want to see where the different zones fit in relationship to these points, yeah. but um, yeah, absolutely. I think the the, vi- the visual, it, it's always a little bit tricky when you when you're trying to, I guess, un- understand where some of these zones fit. To, like to physically see some of that that info can just make it a hell of a lot easier yeah. to interpret. Then, like, it, the, the, I think the visuals the visual is really helpful. Um, so hopefully, I've I've made it a little bit simple to to understand just from from listening. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, we've definitely got like. I've got a few things on YouTube and, and Instagram, things like that, that you can definitely check out to, to see well, what does this actually mean. And if someone's listening in their car, what should, what should they search for when they get home? If they're going to look you up and find your YouTube and your podcast and stuff. Yeah. So um, oh, YouTube-wise, it's pretty simple. It's just my name, Nick Jankowski. So easiest way would be copy and paste my name from, I'm sure, the, the episode <laughs> description um, across uh, there's not too many of us. Um, I do have a website, nickjankoffices.com, that has links to everything in terms of um, podcasts and, and YouTube and a bunch of other resources as well. But then otherwise on Instagram, it's it's at nj underscore sports science. Uh, okay. probably the, that's probably the main place that I, I am in terms of if you want to get in contact and send a message to, to ask any questions, it's probably the easiest way to get in contact. Cool. I'll put links to those in the description as well. But yeah, like I said, incredibly helpful. Thank you for being so generous with your time to to help us make sense of all of this. And uh, no, all good. Appreciate you you having me on. And um, yeah, I'll be keen to see some of the the future podcast episodes that come up as well. I'll uh, I'll stop the recording there, mate. One sec. Easy.